Hi everyone, welcome and good evening. My name is Lauren Artilles on behalf of Harvard Bookstore. I'm pleased to introduce this virtual event with Raven Leilani presenting her new novel, Lester, in conversation with Britt Bennett. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. Tonight's event is part of Harvard Bookstore's New Voices in Fiction series, presented with Fred Street, highlighting debut novelists discussing their work and the writing process. We're looking forward to hosting Shruti Swami on August 21st. You can learn more about our programming at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our new email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speaker at any time during the talk tonight, just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase Lester on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you for showing up and tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings these past few months, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. So thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm honored to introduce our speakers. Raven Leilani's work has been published in Granta, McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, Narrative, Yale Review, Conjunctions, The Cut, and New England Review, among other publications. She has won Narrative's ninth annual poetry contest in the Matt Clark Editor's Choice Prize, as well as short fiction prizes from Bat City Review and Blue Earth Review. She holds an MFA from NYU, and she's also an excellent painter. Britt Bennett is the author of the acclaimed new novel, The Vanishing Half. She earned her MFA in fiction at the University of Michigan, where she won the Hopwood Award in graduate short fiction, as well as the 2014 Hurston Wright Award for college writers. She is the National Book Foundation Five Under 35 awardee, and her debut novel, The Mothers, was a New York Times bestseller. Her essays are featured in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, The Paris Review, and Jezebel. Tonight, they'll be discussing Raven's highly anticipated debut novel, Lester. Her protagonist, Edie, is a painter with IBS and a ravenous eye for detail. Rootless to begin with and further cut adrift by the loss of her job, she finds herself living in the spacious Jersey house of her married lover. Raven spins out her magnificent novel around this ungainly arrangement as Edie witnesses and tries to be witnessed to carve space for herself where none has been provided. In Luster, says Caitlin Greenidge, Raven Leilani has created a character unlike any other in recent fiction, a slacker black queen, a depressive painter, a damn funny woman. Leilani is such a talented writer, I rest to the end of every outrageous sentence to figure out how she would pull it off. And Mary Gates still says, Raven Leilani is intellectually supple and steely at the same time. She thinks and perceives blessedly outside any kind of norms. She has made a truly lustrous piece of art. So now I'm delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Raven and Britt. Uh, so I, I did want to say before I start, thank you, Harvard Bookstore, for you know hosting us, and thank you, Britt, for for doing this, and thank you, everyone um, who is who's come uh, to watch. This is really, really wonderful. Um, I was just going to read a little bit from the first chapter of the books. I think that's easiest, uh, requires uh, no preface. Um, and I'll just, I'll just read a little bit. The first time we have sex, we are both fully clothed at our desk during working hours, bathed in blue computer light. He is uptown processing a new bundle of microfiche, and I am downtown handling corrections for a new laboratory detective manuscript. He tells me what he ate for lunch and asks if I can manage to take off my underwear in my cubicle without anyone noticing. His messages come with impeccable punctuation. He is fond of words like taste and spread. The empty text field is full of possibilities. Of course, I worry about IT remoting into my computer or my internet history warranting yet another disciplinary meeting from HR, but the risk, the thrill of a third pair of unseen eyes. The idea that someone in the office with that sweet post-lunch break optimism might come across this thread and see how tenderly Eric and I have built this private world. In his first message, he points out a few typos in my online profile and tells me he has an open marriage. His profile pictures are candid and loose, a grainy photo of him 
asleep in the sand, a photo of him shaving, taken from behind. It is this last photo that moves me, the dirty tile and soft recession of steam, his face in the mirror, stern with quiet scrutiny. I save the photo to my phone so I can look at it on the train. Women look over my shoulder and smile, and I let them believe he is mine. Otherwise, I have not had much success with men. This is not a statement of self-pity. This is a statement of the facts. Here is a fact. I have great breasts which have warped my spine. More facts. My salary is very low. And I have trouble making friends, and men lose interest in me when I talk. It always goes well initially, but then I talk too explicitly about my ovarian torsion or my rent. Eric is different. Two weeks into our correspondence, he tells me about the cancer that ravaged half his maternal family. He tells me about an aunt he loved who made potions with fox hair and hemp, how, he, how she was buried with a corn husk doll she made of herself. Still, he describes his childhood home lovingly, the digressions of farmland between Milwaukee and Appleton, the yellow-breasted chats and tundra swans that would appear in his yard looking for seed. When I talk about my childhood, I only talk about the happy parts. It's a tape of Spice World I received for my fifth birthday, the Barbie I melted in the microwave when no one was home. Of course, the context of my childhood, the boy bands, the Lunchables, the impeachment of Bill Clinton, only emphasizes our generational gap. Eric is sensitive about his age and about mine, and he makes a considerable effort to manage the 23 year discrepancy. He follows me on Instagram and leaves lengthy comments on my posts. Retired internet slang interspersed with earnest remarks about how the light falls on my face. Compared to the inscrutable advances of younger men, it is a relief. We talk for a month before our schedules align. We try to meet earlier, but things always come up. This is just one way his life is different from mine. There are people who count on him, and sometimes they need him urgently. Between his abrupt cancellations, I realize that I need him too, in a way that makes my dreams delirious expressions of thirst, long stretches of yellow desert, cathedrals hemmed in dripping moss. So by the time we set out our, for our first real date, I would have done anything. He wanted to go to Six Flags. We decide to go on a Tuesday. When he rolls up in his white Volvo, I have only made it to the part of my pre-date routine where I try to find the most appropriate laugh. I put on three dresses before I find the right one. I tie up my braids and lie my eyes. There are dishes in the sink and a pervasive salmon smell in the apartment, and I don't want him to think it has anything to do with me. I put on a complex pair of underwear that is not so much underwear as a bundle of string, and I stand before the mirror. I think to myself, you are a desirable woman. You are not a dozen gerbils in a skin casing. Outside, he is double parked. He leans against the car and remains like this as I come out, his eyes bright and still. His hair is darker than I expected, a black so opaque it looks blue. His face is almost obscenely symmetrical. The one of his eyebrows is higher than the other, and it makes his smile seem a little smug. It is the second day of summer, and all the city's powers have no sway over him. I reach for his hand, trying not to swallow my tongue, and something feels strange. Of course, there are nerves. In person, he is a total daddy, his face alert and hard, softened only by a slight recession of his hair. But this strange feeling has nothing to do with that, nothing to do with me looking past his sensuous mouth and slightly askew nose for any indication that he is as nervous as I am. It is that it is 8.15 a.m. and I feel happy. I am not on the L, smelling someone's lukewarm pickles, wishing I were dead. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you uh, for reading that, Raven. Um, thank you everybody for being here. Um, I am personally very excited uh, to be here with you right now, Raven. Um, I was first sent this book in I think December. It was a long time ago. Um, and I just remember reading it and texting my, my friend Raid, who's a former bookseller at Literati. And I was just like, have you heard of this book? Um, I texted Angela Flournoy and was like, have you read this yet? <laughs> Um, and that seems to be the reaction of everyone I've talked to who has read this book, um, is wanting to sort of find other people to, to scream to the rafters about um, how much we're all enjoying this book. So I'm so excited. I've been waiting for almost a year for everyone else <laughs> to be able to read a thing that I have read. Um, so it's personally very exciting uh, for me just to be here with you on your pub day. Um, so congrats, first of all. Um, and, and yeah, I just have some questions so we could talk about the book a bit. Um, and to everyone watching, if you have questions for Raven, please drop them into uh, the question box and we'll get to your questions a little bit later towards the end. Um, so, so the first thing, I'm, I'm glad that you read from the opening of the book. Um, the opening of the book is so striking. And I was just curious, where did you begin with this novel? Was it 
with the characters? Was it sort of the situation that we opened with? Was it an image? Um, what was kind of the first thing that came to you when you were thinking about writing this book? I would say that it, you know, when I, when I start writing anything, it's more about the feeling, okay. <laughs> you know, I actually truly don't have a, like a plan, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I kind of write to find it out, but mm -hmm. I knew that when I, uh, when I started this book that I wanted to write, uh, you know, I, I wanted to write Edie, you know, I wanted to write a, uh, a young black woman who like feels a lot, who's earnest and who like, you know, just feels desire, um, mm -hmm. in a way that is, uh, well, I mean, derange is, 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 has a connotation, right? <laughs> but like, there's, there's a, there's a pitch to, uh, to feeling that I wanted to strike with this book, which is the kind of like, the, the kind of, the kind that's uncool, you know, the, uh -huh. the kind of a little bit, uh, a little bit jagged. Yeah. And so I, I started out uh, with her seeking that connection, with her wanting to be witnessed and touched uh, and sort of following her, uh, trying, to, trying to make those connections and making the mistakes you might make mm -hmm. uh, when you're kind of being led uh, led along by by that feeling and mm -hmm. sort of the second thing that I wanted to that I started with is something that you know I feel like is in a lot of my writing which is mm -hmm. art um I I knew that you know at the end of this the first chapter I don't think it's like a, a spoiler you know she mm -hmm. begins to paint for the first time after two years and I I wanted to speak to you know what what that feels like what that feels like to have not made anything for a long time yeah. to grapple with uh, those, you know, those limits with yeah. the, the vision you have in your in your head and you know the ability or lack of ability you have to actually express that on the page for me or you know or on the mm -hmm. canvas. Um, that I more than anything, you know, beside what it actually looks like to make art, I wanted to I wanted to write about a feeling like that. Yeah, I love that. Um, so I read the, there's a really great uh, BuzzFeed profile on you that came out, I think maybe today that I read this morning. Um, and I think the headline was that they called this book the next great millennial novel. Um, and there was a quote in there that I really loved, which was, for Leilani, millennial is not a dirty word. Um, so I wanted to start there because we all know that often, um, and within the culture, millennial is often a dirty word. Um, you know, I think as millennials, we're often sort of these kind of cultural punching bags almost, uh, where we are, uh, you know, we're sort of spoiled, entitled brats, we're overly sensitive, all of the tropes. Um, so I, I, I wanted to start here because this, I think, was, was the first thing that really struck me reading this book. And when I'm texting my friends about it, it was one of for me, I think it was the first book that I had read about being a millennial that felt real to me. Um, that felt, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I think really it was the first thing that I was like, yes, this. Um, so I'm, I'm so fascinated about that. And, and, I'm, and I wanted to, to ask you a little bit about writing about sort of millennials in this, in this way. Um, so one thing I was just curious was, was, were you sort of aware of these larger kind of cultural narratives surrounding millennials as you were writing this book? Um, and if so, uh, you know, in what ways did you want to tell a different type of story about millennials than, than maybe some of those that are, that are, we have seen sort of in the larger culture? Sure. I mean, I, I was 100% aware <laughs> of like the, I thought so. you know, <laughs> sector of, of the millennial yes. in, in culture, in fiction, everywhere. Mm -hmm. I, I think there is a, um, and in fact, I think a lot of that, uh, cultural property, I, I love. I, I really love and eat up, mm -hmm. um, and I think the the conversations we have around millennial life are um, they're conversations about sort of the frivolity yes. <laughs> of 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 that of, of well at its core trying to find meaning and trying to find meaningful work mm -hmm. and what that looks like uh, in a context that is highly pressurized mm -hmm. um, and and for for, you know, for Edie, and I think, I hope I, I hope I get this right, I, uh, Tiana Clark, I think a, a couple years ago, she wrote a in, in beautiful essay about um, what it is to be, uh, you know, a millennial of color. Because I think that when we're having this conversation, what we're often talking about is like the white millennial experience. And so when I was, when I started this book, you know, I, it wasn't like I got, came to the page and I, said, well, I'm going to, you know, this will be the, you know, the, 
the story for millennial, you know, people of color, but I wrote, I drew from my life. I, I drew, and, and that's tricky to say because you don't necessarily want to conflate, right. you know, the story with, you know, the, the author, but I drew from my life and, and what it, what it meant for me to have worked a string of, of jobs that were, you know, that helped me eat, but that didn't necessarily mean anything, what it meant to grind and sort of the absurdity of, of trying to meet those, uh, like kind of brutal capitalist demands while you're searching for meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and because Edie is a black woman, like the story is, the story just kind of naturally is different as it was different for me when I felt, when I heard those conversations and I, you know, occasionally was charged with trying to explain, you know, what, what we thought we were doing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, it was, it's not, it's not a dirty word to me because I am, you know, I am millennial. I, it's, I think Edie, I wrote her from, you know, the POV of millennial, but the day she's sort of right on the cusp. Um, but she is, I think in, in the pursuit of art, and she's up against herself, naturally, but these real systemic barriers that I think we all kind of relate to in, in, within this context that is, uh, you know, she's up against racism and sexism and capitalism. And, you know, all those things are intertwined. And I wanted to talk about how those impediments shape an artistic journey, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are young and uh, kind of rootless and and looking for meaning, mm -hmm. and, and so I, I tried to I tried to write the story humanely. Though I will say, you know, I absolutely was aware of those trappings and absolutely indulged them, you know, one hundred percent. But I think for me, it was crucial to, to tell the story um, that I knew um, and yes. the story that I don't think people are really talking about when we invoke, you know, the millennial. Yes. A hundred percent. Um, I totally agree. <laughs> um, I, I think I saw a tweet or something. I saw somebody trying to claim her for Gen Z and I felt very defensive uh, <laughs> as a millennial. How dare you? <laughs> um, Gen Z cannot have her. Um, I love that. Um, so, so one of the things that, that this then that makes me think about, and you've talked about this a little bit, um, is the role of work in this novel, which is something else that I really loved because I think, Weirdly enough, I think a lot of fiction does not pay attention to work and, and what people are doing for money and just the yeah. logistics of work. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and not just fiction, but you know, God knows TV doesn't often pay attention. You're just like, how do these people live in these apartments? What are they doing to afford it? Um, so I, I, one of the things that I really loved about this book, there are lots of different, very specific types of work um, that, are, that are done in this book. Um, so when we start the novel, Edie is working this a publishing job um, that she hates <laughs> um, and um, and then she also eventually is you know entering the gig economy or she's delivering food um, and there are all these other specific types of, of jobs that people are doing are very specialized and specific and I think all sort of jobs that I think the common or maybe the average person is not necessarily thinking about you know sure. somebody who's, who is a medical examiner or somebody you know these other yeah. types of these other types of work that are a little bit invisible to the average person going about their life. So I was just wondering about how did you think about the role of work and just jobs and, sure. and the type of labor that these characters are doing in this book? Um, it feels like something that was important to you as you were, as you were writing the story. Definitely. Um, with, you know, I feel like my ears perk up, you know, when I, when I'm watching TV or I'm reading a book where, where I see characters at work and, and I like, I feel like I keep like relating it back to my life, but in, in so many ways, I kind of wrote what I knew. Yeah. And the sort of crucial questions that, uh, that sort of have shaped my, my, my life is, uh, how do I, how do I pay rent? You know, how do I, how do I pay my student loans? And I know that that is not a, a super special thing, you know, like that is, that's so many of us. And I think on a craft level, how a character is satisfying those fundamental needs is, is, is character, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to, I wanted to write toward that. I wanted to show, you know, I wanted to show the negotiation to make, you know, for Edie at least as an artist, uh, you know, that survival coming up against, well, a kind of different kind of survival, I suppose, mm -hmm. like, you know, the survival of, 
having money, you know, to, to pay the bills that allows you to do the work, but that also kind of is an impediment to you doing the work. Um, I wanted, to, I, I actually did work for Postmates briefly, mm-hmm. and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to speak to and use the word invisible. Like there's, mm-hmm. there is something um, like both extremely brutal and athletic about that work, but also uh, deeply mm-hmm. invisible. You know, mm-hmm. she feels spectral, you know, on those pages when she's working those jobs, she's moving from room to room to room. And in a way, you know, uh, that kind of work, it, it's dehum- it dehumanizes you. It kind of strips you of a of, of feeling. You know, there, there's a moment in the book where she's on her route mm-hmm. and uh, she's like, she's, you know, delivering pies or soup or whatever. And she's fielding these texts from Eric uh, about, you know, he wants her to send nudes mm-hmm. <laughs> while this is <laughs> happening. And she, she, she has a moment, she's like, how like I do I even have parts you know like do I even have parts to take pictures of like I think there's you know an element that kind of it strips you down to like your most your most animal yeah and you know in in terms of the the other jobs in the book you know I I, I've worked many of them like Mm -hmm. the archival work Right. Was I wrote a lot of those scenes still though, um, not just because I had worked them, but uh, in service of talking about record keeping, which mm-hmm. I think art is. And with the Rebecca character, um, with her work as a medical examiner, I thought, you know, this book, I want it to be very bodily. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, because this book is so preoccupied with the study of art, it felt like a great way to kind of right. bring in uh, that sort of that rigor, that traditional study of the body. And also yeah. my, my mom had that job and right. I saw her work once. I saw her like absolutely, like this, disassemble a body. Yeah. Um, and it was miraculous. You know, I, I wanted to write toward, toward that. Um, yeah. So I think it was like a combination of wanting to, to talk about, you know, the necessity and the brutality of work, but also, you know, the jobs that I also kind of just, yeah obsessed with mm-hmm. I love that I love that idea also of, of work work revealing character and then that then sort of the themes all echoing off of each other in these different ways <laughs> um I love that um and I think you know also this the stuff that you were saying about um you know postmates and all of those things I just remember that the details of those sections are so good like you know the idea of like when people are ordering soup and like the inconvenience of these various things that you have to you know, again, like, you know, I think most, you know, a lot of people you're ordering the Postmates because this is what you want to eat. You're not thinking right. about what right. the person delivering it is going to have to endure to bring it to you, you know? Right. And, and, I, and I think also what you're saying about work is also, again, to me, feels so integral to also the experience of being a millennial, of the instability of these traditional yeah. work sectors that, yeah. that have crumbled as we were entering these fields. That's um, right. you know, like that kind of instability that, that we've experienced as a generation. So it, that, that's also, I think another, another way that this book, I think felt very real to me. It wasn't, you know, rich 20 somethings and, you know, apartments right. that their parents bought for them or whatever. <laughs> um, um, so, um, so, so another thing that we've, we've talked about a bit is art. Um, and, um, as you've said, uh, Edie is an artist and you also are an artist. Um, and I, I saw in your profile in the New York Times, um, another thing that everybody should read, um, that you, you described yourself as, as a good but not great artist. Um, yeah. and, and that's essentially how Edie sees herself. Um, yeah. So the, the line that you, you wrote that I really loved is, I am good but not good enough, which is worse than simply being bad. Yeah. Um, and it, it made me also think about that line from, from the most recent um, adaptation of Little Women, um, you know, I want to be great or nothing. Yes. So yes. Um, I, I wanted to, to uh, ask you sort of what, uh, what interested you in writing about not only art, but ambition. Um, you know, I, I think that reading this, this book, I think there was a version of this book where there's a bad version of this book where, <laughs> um, where we're reading to be like, is Edie going to make it big as an artist? Um, right. But that was never the energy as you're reading the book to discover that. Yeah. Um, it's about something else that she is seeking as an artist. So I'm just curious about what, what was interesting to you about her as an artist, her ambition as an artist. Um, what were those questions that you were, you were concerned with as you were writing this book? 
I think in, in writing her, I, I wanted to, you know, I hope to explore the question of like who has right to, to claim, you know, mm -hmm. that artistry or, or the right to, to seek it out. And I think, you know, the, the question of work is, is central in that too, is, mm -hmm. you know, she is a person who is, uh, you know, <laughs> she's a person who is distorted in some ways by the, the kind of constant performance that is demanded of her mm -hmm. to live and survive. And there is, I do not think that it is possible to, to make art from a place of distortion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, I wanted to speak to, you know, like she can't get her own face down on, on the canvas, mm -hmm. you know, and I, when, I, when I wrote those scenes, there was a part of me that was speaking to, uh, you know, like the, the real frustration and madness of, uh, of having a thing inside you that you cannot effectively communicate, whether or not, you know, for some, you know, for me, it was because I did not really truly have those technical building blocks and it was, it was very hard for me to grasp them. Um, for Edie, you know, that's kind of the case, but, uh, I think part of it is she is, she's kind of on this journey of self-actualization and she is, uh, oriented as an eye, as an observer, as a, you know, because she's an artist and, and that has, that has skewed her, her, her concept of herself. Um, and so like in, in writing about Edie, creating art, I was kind of at the same time writing about her being able to, to see herself, um, being, you know, and I also too, like failure was really important to me mm -hmm. in, in, in talking about art because I think uh, with any medium that is so much of it, that's like mm -hmm. so much of the ball game. And so it wasn't important, like, like you said, it isn't about her, like, you know, and then she makes it. it it's more right. about like the, right, the process of, of a failure, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and how you, how you grapple with that, how you grapple with those, those limits that come up and in, you know, in this case, some of them are, um, social, mm -hmm. um, economic, um, personal, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I, I wanted to speak to that, uh, to the sort of untidiness of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, so, so along that, that line of, of untidiness, as you said, which I like as a, as a phrase. Um, so one of the things I think that also really struck me reading this book, uh, is that, um, Edie is a black, is a young black woman who struggles. <laughs> she yeah. struggles a lot. Um, she, <laughs> she struggles, you know, financially. She's got this job that she hates, that she, um, does not care much about the beginning of the book. Um, you know, she's struggling in her personal life. Um, she lives in a terrible apartment. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think that there was something else that, that struck me reading that book. Um, there was somebody, I, I, forget, I wish I could remember who tweeted this, but it was about um, Zoe Kravitz and the High Fidelity adaptation that's on Hulu right now. Yes. Um, and they, they referred to it as Dirtbag Black Girl Representation. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, and I would like to submit Edie to that, that canon of dirt bag black girl. Um, and which again, I loved, I think that there is often, uh, you know, a tendency to, to make black women sort of super women, you know, the sort of Olivia Pope of, you know, and, um, this polishness and she is lacking all of that. So, I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit about thinking of Edie and thinking about her messiness as you were creating this character. Yes, I mean, I, I love the Olivia Pose and then I love the, the you know, the Zoe Kravitz and High Fidel. Like, but we, yes, yes I like, <laughs> you know, rah, rah, more dirtbag black women. Yes, you know, like absolutely. I kind of, <laughs> I, I wanted to make room uh, for a black woman who, who fucks up and mm -hmm. who is allowed the latitude you know, to do that, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, there's a, I mean, I feel like to wade into the, like, the respectability waters is, like, a huge thing, right, you know, <laughs> I, do I want to do that right now, <laughs> no. but, uh, you know, in writing this, I, I wanted to write against the idea of, of a, of a superwoman, mm -hmm. you know, because I think, you know, and I feel strongly, strongly about the fact that, Black women deserve tenderness and to be like loved openly and out loud, and that somehow we are still in a moment in which that 
that tenderness is, is radical when it is important mm -hmm. uh, to black women. And I, but I think part of that is because we are, uh, you know, black women are often sort of positioned as these uh, superhuman, mm -hmm. you know, beings who are kind of virtuous for how much they can endure. And, and that, I wanted to write against that. I wanted to write a character who, uh, she endures a lot, right? I, like, as you, as you were talking, I was like, shit, I, I piled on, you know? Like, <laughs> you know, I wanted you to, like, it was important that you see inside her mind and, and understand that her rage, you know? You understand uh, that, she, that there is complaint <laughs> um, and that there is a human who is deteriorating, you know, mm -hmm. underneath this, this kind of pressure, but also, uh, you know, as a function of that rage is, is having a human response to that, mm -hmm. to that pressure. Yes, I love that. Um, and uh, so I will ask a few more questions and I see there are already some questions coming in the Q&A, so please, if you've got any questions for Raven, pop them in there and, and I'll get to them soon. Um, yeah, I, I loved everything you said about that. There's also, uh, I'm thinking again about the other black woman who works at the publishing office with her. And that's yeah. also a great moment of both of them, you know, being in this extremely white space um, and feeling like there's only room for one of them and only if they play by certain rules and Edie refusing right. to play by those rules. Um, in a way that, that off, obviously that harms her, but also in a way that reading it, I'm cheering for her. Like, yes, refuse to be, you know, make yourself palatable in the way that we right. often have to make ourselves palatable just to survive. So right. I loved that. I love that about this character. Um, so a, a few more things and, and then I'll get to the, the questions from the audience. So one of the things that I, that I wanted to say, and I think it also, this is a thing that is, um, that is altered by Zoom, because I, if we were in a room listening to you read from this book, you would have heard people audibly laughing. Um, so, <laughs> you know, we're talking about a lot of various ser very serious things, but I just want to make sure everybody knows how funny this book is, um, which was honestly the, the context in which I was texting about it to people. It was a lot of the stuff at the beginning about, you know, uh, like swiping and on Tinder dates and the awkwardness of all of those experiences that, that were very funny. And there's a lot of dark humor in this book. Um, so I wanted to ask you about, about the, the use of humor, um, about how you crafted Edie's voice, which the way I've thought about it is that I think it feels weird to dissect why something is funny that immediately makes it not sound funny. Yeah. But <laughs> when I was thinking about it, I'm like, there's a combination of the way that she undersells what's happening and then also just exaggerates it in a yeah. sense. Um, so there, and, and sometimes in the same sentence, that thing is happening. Um, so, so for example, a line I really loved was when she's talking about the books that she's working on with the publisher. Um, it says, yes, I delivered on the K through five Maya Angelou and Frida Kahlo biographies where in the sexual assault and bus accident were omitted per a Provo parents group who weren't ready for their kids to see the blood women wade through to create art. And I'm like reading this line and I'm like snickering and then you get to the end and you're just like, oh shit. Yeah. You know? So <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask you about the humor in this book. How did you manage to, to sort of channel the humor, her, humor in her voice in a way that also manages to give you that gut punch as you're reading it? I think, I think you're right about that. Like, uh, you know, I, I actually honestly hadn't really even thought of it in that way, but that there's, so much humor and understatement, you know, and, and, and the fact that it is up against a uh, sort of the sort of a hyperbolic environment that she lives mm -hmm. in. Yes. There's a kind of resignation that uh, is, well, I mean, almost necessary to, to live and, and continue on. And, and you hear that in her voice, but also mm -hmm. I think it is a function because when I started this book, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't set out to, to write jokes, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I really didn't. Um, but then I did, you know, like then, <laughs> then there are definitely books that are, are parts in the book that yeah. I just told jokes that I wanted to tell. But yeah. I do think it's a function of her rage. It's a function mm -hmm. of like the friction between what we are seeing in her mind, you mm -hmm. know, that, sort of that, that private like ooze, that candor that we see there mm -hmm. and the external expectation uh, and performance are, yeah. are are completely dissonant and sometimes uh, yeah, not, not yeah. all the time but I, I think that it, it really the, the root the deepest root is rage but also I would say that um, it also is the way I, I really really love to write mm -hmm. which is 
kind of a real attention to the to the sentence level mm -hmm. in a way where I the writing I like is um, and I mentioned this last night that is a kind of oriented around surprise mm -hmm. and I think you know the poetry I love works like that you know mm -hmm. the comedy I love works like works like that it's about surprise and and when I'm writing I'm and that's what I'm trying to do I'm trying mm -hmm. to subvert that expectation yes. and I think that is partly you know besides the, the jokes that I you know <laughs> little secret jokes that were funny to me and thankfully funny yeah. to other people um that was part of it but also too you know I wanted to make room in this book which handles a lot of, of dark darkness mm -hmm. I wanted to make room for joy mm -hmm. um you know I, I wanted to make room for light because I I did not one want the experience the reading experience to be drudgery and I did not and I wanted my characters my you know especially E uh to to live to be kind of fielding this uh you know this heaviness and also mm -hmm. living in kind of a humorless text yeah. you know i wanted to make room around a black woman where there is light and joy yeah i love that and you do thank um, you you really do um so i'll ask a couple more questions and then I'll, I'll i'll get to questions from the audience so a lot of uh these questions are you know trying to avoid spoilers because i know that um a lot of you guys have not reached the end of the book yet um, but I, I have to um, ask you a little bit about some of these other characters who, who populate the book. Um, so we open with that section you read where we're learning about um, Edie going on this date with, with Eric, who's a 40 something married white dude. Um, and <laughs> um, eventually she becomes entangled in his life and also the life of his wife, Rebecca. Um, and Rebecca, I don't know, was Rebecca my favorite character? I mean, I loved Edie. I don't know if I can choose. I love both of them, honestly. Um, I wanted just like a buddy cop thing with the two of them <laughs> forever. Um, so I'm curious about that kind of triangle that you that you create in the book, um, and particularly the relationship between um, Edie and Rebecca, which eventually begins to sort of supplant the relationship that that she has with Eric. So I'm curious of what drew you into those two people um, together and just the triangle of this this sort of suburban um, open marriage that she ends up falling into. Totally. Uh, so like when I um when I started this book and I and I knew when I was in the middle of it and it was happening, you know, and mm -hmm. I knew that I was writing about an open marriage and uh, I kind of and that I knew I would have the Rebecca character, mm -hmm. you know, the wife who kind of comes in uh, like through the husband. I thought mm -hmm. there's there's one way to write this that is that is familiar and mm -hmm. uh, that could be satisfying, but I, I don't want to do that. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't want it to make it a book in which two women are fighting over a man yes. or in which like the wife is uh, kind of cold, like yeah. jealous, cold, Mad, like, yeah. and then like kind of positioned yeah. as like uh, a person to to, you know, create screeds around you know like I wanted uh I wanted to create like just a whole character who has her own complexities and her own darkness mm -hmm. I mean is also seeking something through this through this union mm -hmm. um and and then it kind of as I you know Edie kind of drew you know came into the house that relationship between them relationship between women you know like mm -hmm. that that became more urgent and more mm -hmm. interesting and in fact i just think those tend to be more interesting like yes. I, and i'm not saying like <laughs> i just love like a juicy you know a sexy book about relationships i really love i like eat that up yes, but yes. um in this book i i wanted to to write about the kind of the complicated romance that that happens between that happens between women you know mm -hmm. who see each other and see like each other's you know kind of uh I don't know, like see their serious, most mm -hmm. uh, kind of dark faces. And, you know, I think Edie is often looking uh, to naturally to her romantic partners for mm -hmm. affirmation of her seriousness, as I think maybe we all have done. Mm -hmm. And uh, it felt more true to me that she would actually find that uh, it, in a woman. Mm -hmm. And a woman who is also serious, who is also mm -hmm. meticulous, but but much more in control than she is, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but it's it's not uncomplicated, you know. Edie's black yes. and lives, you know, 
kind of has is coming from a very precarious uh, moment, and and Rebecca is you know white in, in comfortable and mm -hmm. and very much in control. Yes, and you know Edie enters this union on her terms, mm -hmm. and so there are there are real fundamental differences that they have mm -hmm. to reconcile in this relationship, and I wanted to be really candid about that. You know, I didn't want to gloss over that. Um, and it kind of, in its own way, it lent to uh, what almost kind of began to feel like an eroticism between them. Mm -hmm. um, but I did want to speak to that, you know, the reality of what that relationship is, so the quiet kind of violence that mm -hmm. sometimes marks those relationships. Um, but it was, it was just fun to write because there, mm -hmm. was, there was so much to play with and that it just easily became kind of the the more primary relationship rather than yeah. the relationship with the husband. Yeah, I love that. Um, so, okay, the last question I'll ask before before going to the audience is the last sort of central character we haven't quite yet talked about is Akila, um, Eric and Rebecca's adopted Black daughter. Mm -hmm. um, so once we learn that, that Edie is entering into this so in marriage, we also learned that there is a surprise child um, that we didn't know about in the mix. And not only that, but she is black. Um, so, and, and she is such a vivid character. I think it's really hard to write uh, kids. Um, yeah. At least for me, it is. Yeah, no, I, yes, I agree. Right? Yeah. Okay. I feel like I sound like, you know, I, I just, I find it hard to write kids. Um, but she's so vividly drawn um, and she is so isolated in this sort of suburban white world in which she's positioned. Um, and I, I, I was very surprised by, by her presence when she appears. Um, and I'm curious if you could just talk a little bit about what you wanted to explore about sort of these questions of race and, and intimacy um, when it comes to those four characters that you have brought together uh, eventually sure. in the book. Um, well, I, you know, in terms of writing a, a child, I think sort of my way around that in this book was that, you know, Akila is, is uh, wizened in a way, and in and, and, and that way, you know, for reasons that are not great, you know, she mm -hmm. hasn't really been able to inhabit the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the ignorance that is bliss that children um, are kind of owed. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, in that way, there is like a, there's a really complex dynamic between her and Edie, mm -hmm. who I think is, <laughs> who I think is still acting out of her own kind of complicated, uh, like formative development and, you know, context. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, when, when I brought Akila in, the most, you know, immediate parallel was uh, Edie is a person who is, who is isolated. Mm -hmm. you know, for, for a number of reasons, and, and trying to, to reconcile that, that isolation. Um, but I, I wanted to bring her into contact with another, you know, Black woman who mm -hmm. is also uh, preoccupied with those questions mm -hmm. uh, of, of finding, finding the self, uh, realizing the self in environments that cannot adequately see them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was important for me to, to kind of have that, you know, have some kinship in the middle of, yeah, of this of this darkness but at the same time like with the other characters with uh eric and rebecca as uh you know white parents who are, who are trying to uh sensitively uh raise uh this child you know i didn't want i also didn't want to make to step that up to be a uh <laughs> a situation in which i you know deliver a um you know a speech <laughs> of like you know, whether, like, a moral kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. around. Yeah. I wanted to, like, I thought it would be more more tender and more human to to try and grapple with yeah. them actually really wanting to try and do the right thing and, and kind of fucking up anyway, yes, you know? Yes. Um, and so all of those characters, you know, in one environment together, that was honestly, it was the hardest part yeah. of the book for me. Um, but I, I wanted to... I wanted to sensitively um, uh, and humanely explore yeah. those, you know, those power dynamics. You know, I wanted to explore what each character is seeking and, mm -hmm. and give them room to uh, have human responses. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, so, so yeah, so we have time for some questions with the audience. If anyone has any more, send them my way. Um, so, 
let's see. Oh, so this question I really love. This is from Marissa. It says, how has your background in visual art and poetry influenced your approach to fiction and constructing prose? I would say that um, with poetry, uh, I, you know, what I really loved about my I mean, first initial thing that I really loved about poetry was the energy of, of mm -hmm. the language. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, when I was in undergrad, I, I thought that I was going to go into psychiatry mm -hmm. and I was taking these like uh, medical prerequisites, but I still found myself in class kind of, I was at the time I was obsessed with um, Allen Ginsberg's Howl, you know, mm -hmm. because that is like, it is like, I think embodies what is like what I really, really love about poetry, what mm -hmm. it builds and it is like the payoff is beautiful and um, it is just, it's full of, you know, color and imagery mm -hmm. and with poetry, that energy and also that discipline because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, depending on what, you know, kind of form it is, you have a certain allotment of space uh, is something that I, I really try to bring to, to writing and with, with um, the painting, Mm -hmm. It was, it, it more is just a, a preoccupation that now um, just finds its way into everything I write because I, I think I, I still feel that initial frustration of, of, of having a thing I want to express and not being able to. And mm -hmm. so I'm always like over and over again, I'm writing about what that's like. Um, mm -hmm. And I also get to, you know, I get to write about the body, yes. you know, so that is, I think those are sort of the main ways that they kind of. Uh, influence the writing. Those both seem very like very useful things to know <laughs> how to do and to think about. Um, I, I can't do anything except write so I'm like <laughs> I wish. Um, okay we have a few more questions. So so this question um, said so you mentioned that the millennial woman of color perspective is not often heard. Um, how do you approach writing from these perspectives from these perspectives that are often untold in fiction? Well, I mean, I just, I honestly think I just wrote what I knew, you mm -hmm. know, I, 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 I wanted to write a woman who is, you know, her, her, her search to find, find meaning in work, to find stability, uh, is, is treated with seriousness as opposed mm -hmm. to sort of diminished as mm -hmm. a, you know, as a sort of, I don't know, whim, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like I, I wanted to, I wanted to talk about, um, inhabiting those 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 highly pressurized environments and the you know the absurdity of, of, of living and being human and, and feeling um and what that means when you are uh you know when you're also tasked with um kind of the performance demanded mm -hmm. of you depending on on the room you're in i think I, I wanted to speak to the almost the impossibility of that you know the exhaustion of that mm -hmm. uh, uh the way that in a different way uh, deteriorates you, you know, yes. and in this context, she's an artist. Um, and, and so that, that felt relevant to talk about. Uh, so in terms of like writing about, you know, a millennial woman mm -hmm. who's, you know, a, a woman of color, it, it was more just incorporating like the other kind of dimensions that, you know, on top of the kind of the, the general shorthand we know. Mm -hmm. and, and and kind of teasing apart that the pressure of that. Yes, love that. Um, another question: Somebody wanted to know what your how your uh, your MFA experience at NYU was. Um, I hope this isn't a spicy question for you to answer. <laughs> I don't know if anybody from your cohort is watching. You can you know call people <laughs> out from your workshop. <laughs> Name names. Um, <laughs> no, no, but no. How, was your, how was your experience at NYU this first year? It was really, it was really great. You know, That's like I, I had worked for, um, you know, I'd been in DC for like four to five years before mm -hmm. I came back to New York to, mm -hmm. do the, to do the MFA. And there is, you know, I had been working on my stuff, uh, you know, after work for those mm -hmm. four to five years. And for me, you know, and I, I think I had done what most people do which is kind of waffle on the question, like, should I, should I not? You know, right. I, I did that for years. You know, mm -hmm. I, 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 I say I want to go sooner, but I kind of don't actually now. I think I need to have worked on my craft as long mm -hmm. as I did. Um, but uh, it, was, it was an environment that I feel like forced me to articulate uh, my intent in a different mm -hmm. way than I, than I normally would have. Because mm -hmm. like I said earlier, I, I just kind of 
uh, I just kind of fly by the seat of my pants when I, when I mm-hmm. write, um, mm-hmm. you know, not to say there's no craft involved, you know, but mm-hmm. like, I really just write forward to find it out. And in a, a room with, uh, you know, a group of people who are open and vulnerable and treat the work with seriousness, like that, that was, that meant so much to me. And it meant so much to me, I think, partly because I had come from, you know, five years of, of work and a nine to mm-hmm. five. And yeah. So those two years I spent there, which is where I started the book, it almost felt like I have to do it now. Like Mm -hmm. I have to do it now. And that environment really facilitated that. It it gave me the, you know, well, the excuse to kind of, to to read more. You know, I feel Mm -hmm. like those five years before, I I wish I'd been able to read more, you know, Mm -hmm. to see how things are put together, to kind of, to concentrate totally on the work and, and to find a community, which was really important to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the person who asked said, sorry for the spicy question. I don't think it was spicy at all. I just did not know. Um, <laughs> um, uh, okay, so you have another question. Someone said, immense cra- congratulations on the debut novel, Raven. What do you enjoy doing when you're not writing or doing book events? What are your other passions outside of writing? So, I mean, I would, I would say it is painting. Because, like, it really, that is what I have been doing. Like when the pandemic started, uh, like a switch flipped, mm-hmm. and I just, I just started. Like I had, like I could paint, and I actually feel like I've been able to paint more than I write lately, to be honest. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so that is a big. I'm trying to, trying to, you know, learn more of the sort of technical fundamentals that I mm-hmm. think as a teen, like a, a kind of sour grapes teen, I just kind of like didn't want to hear about, and so yeah. I'm kind of trying to make a real rigorous go you know, it's still private work uh, of, of painting, and that has been I really nice, um, and, and in general, I think, you know, I, I, I kind of have, I think I do what I think most of us do as writers, where we kind of, we're writing, but we're not writing, you know, yeah. like, I, I'm, like, trying to think of, uh, you know, waiting for the time where I can carve out a moment mm-hmm. to, to kind of, start on the the books that are still inside me. So more than anything, it is really just, I paint when I can. And right now life is about um, kind of launching this book. And because it's my first time, you know, I'm kind of, I'm learning a lot and uh, growing a lot. And um, it's it's pretty much, I think that's mostly what I'm doing now. Yeah. Um, uh, Okay, so somebody, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, somebody wanted to know about your literary influences. Sure. Um, I, uh, I would say, I mean, I would say like the, the ones that are, it, it's always, it feels like extremely obvious to um, invoke Toni Morris's name, right? But like, how do you, like, <laughs> like you <laughs> of look, course. Yeah. Just, like the beauty, the beauty on like this, even just a census level, even beyond like her genius and mm-hmm. moving through time and interiority, you know, like I, I would say, um, I really, really, I, honestly, Brent, I have been saying you, and like, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, but like truly, you were just like supreme and, uh, you know, so yes, you. <laughs> oh, okay. That's so and, sweet. Thank you. <laughs> um, I really, really love, uh, Otessa Moshweg, I, I just love sort of the, the cleanness, the brutality of her prose. I love Susan Choi. Uh, I mean, I, my education was, I read that, I think, the first week or so, like not as an assignment, but just like someone gave me that book. They're like, you mm-hmm. like Obsession, you'll love this book. And it is just, you know, she has a way of writing the most, like, sensory the most tactile prose. Um, I love uh, Jennifer Egan. Uh, mm-hmm. I think she's amazing. I love Yag Yassi. Like, it's just like, I, I'm, I'm like saying influences, but like, they're, you know, also <laughs> hopefully peers too. And, uh, I just, I really, I just feel on fire when I, mm-hmm. when I read prose that is, you can feel like the feeling, you know, mm-hmm. in the work. Um, so those, those are, those are a few. Yeah. I love that. Um, so we have a few more, uh, 
Um, somebody wanted to know, oh, what are you reading right now? I don't know if you have time because you're launching a book, um, but what are you reading right now or, if, or what are you looking forward to reading maybe? So I think there are like, there are so many really, really great debuts coming mm -hmm. out and, and have come out this year. Um, I really love Days of Distraction by Alexander Chang. I love um, Lakewood by Megan Giddings. These Ghosts Are Family by Lindsay mm -hmm. Card. Um, I love A Burning by Megan Marjandar. Um, I really love The Lightness by Emily Temple. Um, gosh, there, there, like, there are so many. Like, I don't want to mm -hmm. like leave How Much of <laughs> These Feels Is Gold by Pam Zang. Mm -hmm. uh, Being Lolita by Alison Wood. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm I'm kind of looking just looking forward to uh, Transcendent Kingdom, like the Gap's mm -hmm. new new one. Like I'm really excited about that. Um, but I, I kind of I went and I got a bunch of books that I you know some of these I haven't really cracked yet, but I you know mm -hmm. are gonna be just beautiful. Yeah, awesome. Um, and let's see. Oh, somebody wanted to know within your world. Uh, within the world of your novel, what is liberating or what is constricting, or how would you sort of describe the open relationship that you're writing about? Um, I guess within the world of the novel, do you do you, did you see it as something that is liberating, fraud in some other way? I think <laughs> you know. I think it's complicated having having finished the book. It seems, but I'm curious. What would you would think about the process of writing about an open relationship, open marriage? You know, I'm I'm actually really surprised by. Um, how uh, kind of uh, potentially controversial that that seems to be right now. Mm -hmm. um, like when I wrote it, it felt uh, it felt because it is like predicated on rules and a kind of understanding of mm -hmm. what you know each partner is seeking. Um, it, it is an arrangement. Mm -hmm. it, it felt like th there's there's actually like an unsexiness to that. You know, like <laughs> uh, I agree. That, I, uh, that I, I wanted to, when I wrote that, I just wanted to write, um, humanely about sort of the, the kind of different ways, mm -hmm. uh, people who are in a relationship, because I, you know, on the page, Eric and Rebecca, they have, a, you know, it's not the best marriage, right? But like, they, there is love there, you know, mm -hmm. and they're, I think if I'm just going to speak to them, which I kind of feel like I really do, just to like <laughs> marriage, but, you know, they're, they're seeking something. They're trying to kind of, keep it alive and, and stoke, mm -hmm. uh, you know, well, whatever is still there. But I, in writing the, you know, in writing the, the open marriage, it was a, it was a real fun way to kind of subvert the idea of, of an infidelity, which mm -hmm. I think has a shorthand that I really honestly just didn't particularly want to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I just wanted to write about what it looks like when both, when all parties sort of invite this disruption. It, it, yes. you know, um, but I think, you know, morally, it is just you do what you do, what feels good. And, uh, you know, <laughs> what, yeah, you, you do what, you know, no, I don't know how to, how to, you know, <laughs> as far as I, as far as I, you know, think about it, it's a, a thing that happens through kind of a mutual understanding and respect. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I tried to, you know, render it like that. Uh, yeah, I think you did. And, you know, I, I think we're, we're kind of winding down. We're running out of time a little bit. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to say that, you know, I think that when, at least for me, when I'm reading a debut novel, my first, my first thought is, you can't, okay, do I like this novel? My second thought is, do I want to read book two from this person, book three, book four? And that was the feeling I had reading your book was like, I cannot wait. I love Thank this. You. But I also cannot wait to watch this person's career unfold. And I think that that's the best feeling that you can have reading a debut novel. So I, you know, I wanted to say that I'm, I'm, I, um, I'm really happy that we were, we were able to do this. I'm sad it was not in person together, uh, but I'm happy we were able to do this. And I'm so excited for everyone to be able to read this book. Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't know if they're coming. Yes, here we go. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> um, thank you both. I just want to thank you both for that incredible conversation and thank you everyone out there for spending your evening with us. Please learn more about this incredible book and purchase Lester at Harvard.com and also grab The Vanishing Half because it's also incredible. Um, so on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good night and keep reading and stay safe everyone.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.